Thanks for being with us and welcome to Newsnight. I am Ladi Akiri Duluali. On the program today, juxtaposing time-tested values against the challenges of succeeding, the importance of national unity and development, and why society plays a role in career path choosing. My guest is retired Justice of the Supreme Court and now Nigeria's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom, Justice George. Thank you so much for your time. Welcome. It's a pleasure sitting with you. Let me be one of the first to wish you a very happy 80th birthday. Thank you very much. Now, 80 is a milestone that a lot of people, in spite of their wishes, uh, don't reach. Mm. And uh, in Nigeria, our life expectancy is not up to 80. How do you feel at 80? Well, I feel um, very happy. And I have a feeling that uh, my creator has uh, given me the satisfaction of attaining the age of uh, 80. I'm happy about it. Now, uh, if you take a look back, 80 years is a long time. Um, at the time that you were born, things were so different. Um, can you give us an idea? I know. Uh, you, you, your early childhood was in Epe. Yes. Of course, if you go to Epe now, you probably would not be able to recognize what it was then mm -hmm. from what it is now. What was your early childhood like? My early childhood was not uh, spent at Epe, but rather at Ijebode. Uh, it only became necessary for my parents to send me to school at Epe because our own immediate brother was a teacher at Ekwe, and he wanted me to have myself near him. That's about the main reason why I shifted base at the time. Now, Ijebo uh, de Ekwe, as a younger person, now people look at you at 80 and they look at this jurist, uh, diplomat, but back then, what was it like growing up? What was the environment like? What was the society like? Well, what uh, you will expect at, at that time is uh, the likelihood of villagers. And where would be one of them at that time? My immediate uncle, that's the brother of my mother, was a, a teacher and headmaster in a school. And you can know the pleasure of a, a teacher's a brother. I was specially looked after and I enjoyed my early environment thus that way. How did you end up, how did you make the journey from that to ending up in the legal profession? Well, that uh, it became necessary to make a decision on that when I left secondary school. I had finished at the grammar school, Ijabode, from there. I needed to choose what I would do. I haven't uh, left the uh, grammar school. Right. I was lucky to have been invited at the High Court of Ibado to come and be a clerk. And that because uh, my grandparents were based at Ibado. Okay. So when I left second, uh, secondary school, I went straight to Ibado. And I was able to be in the midst of my parents and their presence around me, the, the, the way they uh, teach them. Um, I carried myself in their presence. I was um, convinced that I was a special son who was being uh, specially catered for. So that um, spoiled me in a, in, a, in a way. But um, it's the presence, I missed my brother, my uh, brethren that encouraged me to stay at Ibado and I enjoyed the, the time. Now, uh, that, so you ended up being a court clerk? Court registrar. Court registrar? Yes. And then, so how did you make that transition from there to being a lawyer? Very good. I was at uh, Ibado under the then uh, Chief Justice. I was in his midst and shortly after I got there, 
for some problems in the judiciary. The late uh, Justice, um, who was the CJ in uh, Ibadan, was transferred to Lagos to be CJ in Nigeria. So another one came, another uh, judge who was also made the chief judge in replacement for for the person who went to Lagos. Who went to Lagos? Was the person who went to Lagos Justice Elias? Was it Olawale Elias? No, I think the man before him. Before him, okay, okay, okay. So this new person came. Now, when he came, what did you do? Was he the one who then said you needed to go and do law? No, he didn't tell me anything. He came. He employed me. After a while, the, I thought I was going to be retained at Ibadan. But after about a couple of months, maybe talking about nine months, I was transferred from Ibadan to um, Ikeja. In Lagos? In Lagos. I couldn't uh, live in Ikeja in those days, so I lived in Lagos and you went to, to, to uh, Ikeja, Ikeja from, from time to time. Now, when did you then go study law? When I was at uh, um, Ikeja, I was in the midst of lawyers. There were persons like me who were about uh, my age, old men, but who are still, uh, you know. I was uh, tempted to study law when I saw people talking law, law talking big, and uh, I was impressed. And then of my own volition, I started them um, reading for law, private studies. Luckily, I was able to pass two, two subjects at A level. That's all you needed in those days to be able to be ready for university education. Okay. And I passed two and uh, I passed two advanced and one at uh, O level. So that was enough to take me to London. I had uh, friends around who were talking of London, London all the time, and uh, I was overwhelmed. So I raised money here and there and made my way to London. When I got to London, obviously I had a beginning in law. I chose to work anywhere. I was employed in the post office on a private uh, you know, the, the school board. And doing that, I felt that I would be wasting my time if it didn't at the same time I was doing studies, also prepare myself to do proper studies in the university. Right. So I joined the London External University and I studied and happily I was able to pass for the A-level with honors. So that really uh, empowered me and I felt that, ah, I've taken something big. So I quickly finished my degree course in Lagos and I straight away I made my way for no I finished in London and I came back to Nigeria immediately that's how I became a, a lawyer that's at that mean. time I was ready for the law school so as I came back to Nigeria there was law school in Lagos I did my term three months at my time and then from there I was ready to practice law happily the brief study I had made in law encouraged me to go fully into it as a lawyer. So as soon as I passed the law school, I joined the school, the school of lawyers and I was uh, actively a lawyer. Now, um, I, I, before I take you to the next stage, I, I wanted to then ask, you came to London yes. then and you said, oh, at that time, everybody was on about London. Everybody wanted to come to London. Today, as I sit and speak with you, again, we are in London. Mm. Um, how much of a change has there been between the London that you came first to see then, that would be in the 60s, and today? What have you found to be the profound differences between then and now? At that time, I was a young man of about uh, 25, 24. So, my environment was such that I was in a hurry to conquer life. 
I wanted to be a lawyer, I wanted to show off and things like that. So quickly after I passed the degree, I jumped into the plane and... Uh, you went, went to, back home? I went back home straight away. I didn't hang around in Lagos. In London, you mean? In London, rather. Now, um, but today, you are not so young anymore. Yes. And you look at things with a bit more of a slower eye, if that is the phrase. Yes. Uh, but going back to the journey now, when you then go back to Nigeria and then you started practicing, many people I've spoken to who are lawyers say that the practice of law uh, can be quite lucrative. Mm. And that would explain why some of them stay as lawyers also. But you then went ahead, you didn't stay as a lawyer, you went ahead and became a judge. Why? Don't forget, many years after, I had practiced as a lawyer for about um, 12, 14 years or so before I left the bar. So I was fully mature in life. It was the next thing I could do because I was beginning to form the thoughts of an advancing in age student. So that uh, dragged me from what I would have done ordinarily to join uh, the ranks of senior lawyers. Now, um, at that time too, people in your, in your position, because they were pathfinders, they were the first from their communities in that area, mm. sometimes came under pressure from those communities to go in a particular way so that they too would have a representation in particular areas that they considered critical. Was that in any way related to your own experience as to why you made the switch? That's exactly what caused me to be a judge. Because my uncles, the junior to my junior to my father, were all from Ekwe. So they were putting pressure on me. We needed a lawyer in Ekwe, we needed a judge in Ekwe, all kind of things. So the persuasion I submitted to, and straight away I decided to join the bench. What was the experience like being a judge? Most of us don't ever get to speak to judges except when they have left office. Uh, and sometimes even after they've left office, they don't, they're not very interested in speaking. Um, what was the experience like being a judge? Well, like I said, in those days, a lawyer was regarded as a very honorable. And each uh, city that uh, brought you up as son always wanted to display that their son is now a judge, a big man, and they were all proud of it. So the encouragement they put on you was so that you couldn't uh, resist. That's how I stuck to being a judge. Being a judge. Now, um, I'm not going to ask you about any specific cases or anything like that, but in your experience, do you think that the process of justice, which is the essence of law anyway, uh, has been improved upon, served properly in our own environment, coming from your own background, to what we know to be the situation today. Is, 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 do you think justice, people come to the front of judges seeking justice. Does that not put the judges under pressure when they know that all these people are looking up to them and that they have nowhere else to go? In my time, you, you, we had them, lawyers and judges, of very high standard. And when you looked around and saw those who you saw, you will uh, be inclined of your own volition to do what they were doing. So I will say that we were drawn into it by the honor and integrity we saw fully bestowed on these persons. Now, you went all the way. You headed the Court of Appeals in several states before you were then uh, elevated to the Supreme Court. Um, and then, of course, before you left service. On the overall, what, what lessons, what are the key lessons you took away from that career spanning over three decades? What were the key lessons you took away? What were the things that, when you sit back now and you reflect, 
if you were to give maybe two or three of them key yeah. lessons that you took away, what would they be? Well, being a lawyer, I am sorry, George, yes. put you into a regular meeting with your fellow lawyer or fellow judges. In my first deployment, I was sent to Enugu. I met judges of my rank and I met uh, lawyers from different uh, upbringing. So I made friends there. Shortly after, I was at Ibadan, posted to Ibadan. In the same way, I met uh, judges, we made friends, and from there again to Jaws, from there again to Abuja. So this is uh, a constant moving from uh, group to group ensure that you saw the best of life. You had the uh, people with whom you were at home. You had those who are nasty. You had the uh, superiors who created problems for you. But you went through all and uh, at the end of the day you triumphed. Now, uh, I'm happy you mentioned different types of people, which was going to be my next question. Mm. On the whole, do judges behave like the rest of us when they are not sitting in judgment? Because many people don't see you outside of courts. No. Is that a deliberate policy that people don't see judges outside of courts? Is no. it that they don't socialize? No, that so is not true. Okay. I had friends outside the uh, bench and we discussed, we were friends and we openly go out together at that time, there wasn't anything that stopped you from enjoying your life, except that you would carefully choose who your friends will be. You are free to go out, you are free to go to church, you are free to go to parties, but you don't display excessive uh, overjoy. Right. That's kind of thing, yeah. Now, uh, that brings me to the other side. It's like, there's, is there an oath of silence for judges? You're not allowed to express any opinions on anything. No, no. No, you are not. And this is because these matters might eventually be brought before yeah, you. Yeah, nobody will compare you to swear and also anything. No, no, you won't have that. Okay. And those uh, judges too were sharp boys who grew up in cities and things like that. They are rascals. So they won't allow you to uh, force them to take on a, a line of uh, joy in the judiciary. No. Now, um, if you look back, as we are talking today, there is some young man, some young lady who is watching you today and seeing you as a retired judge and is thinking, maybe I should have a career in law. Maybe I should even, like Justice Okuta, they go on to become a judge. What are the key things you will tell them that they need, apart from education? What are the attributes that they need if they are going to become successful judges? Well, there are factors that demarcate a good uh, judge. Prepare your cases, you read very well. You prepare your judgments, you do it very well. You deliver judgments rapidly after hearing. You are seen as very busy and um, brilliant, you concentrate. Gradually, your image spreads in the bar. And time after time, you rise and mix the lawyers, and you gain recognition, not just at the court you are serving in, beyond that, because other senior judges will hear a lot of what we are doing below as, them. As they are juniors. Yes. Now, let me, something else that marks you out as different uh, from your colleagues, many of them, is that you also took a very strong uh, line in religion. Yes. Um, you were chancellor of the Anglican Communion in Nigeria. For, you, know, you know as much? <laughs> yes. For nine I was years, chancellor for then, Nigeria, yes. And, and then Lagos for more than two decades. Yes. What's that like? What's, what's it like to be a lawyer or a judge who also has a very strong religious bent? Well, I will say that that um, 
the season it was on, I carried from my church in Epe. My uncle, that's the middle junior of my father, was a school head. And the same school. So he drew me there. We went to church together. We were doing things together. And I was always seen as the old son of the principal. So gradually I was very popular. And with that, I was able to, at that time, show my <laughs> my my strength. <laughs> Your strength. Yeah. And now today, did that have impact on how you then conducted yourself in your day job? Certainly, without uh, declaring so many words, when you lived like I did in such circles, in such ranks, you will bow to their feelings, you bow to their ways of doing things. So you will have come uh, substantially to, under the influence of your immediate uh, seniors. And did they offer, I mean, did, were these the people who mentored you? At different levels? Yes. Yes. I mean, both professionally and uh, in terms of the church? Yes. Uh, some of them, of course, would have been some of them may have been professional seniors of yours. Yes. So you would meet them both in church and at work as yeah. well. Yes. Uh, what were the things that they told you that made that give you a focus, principle, guiding principles it going forward? On church line? Yes. What to do? Well, I was uh, active in the church. I took positions within the church, we are societies within the church, we made friends all around you within the church. With that kind of surrounding, you couldn't escape being in this group we were talking about. So after a while, I became an enamored to the church when they wanted certain things on me. And a particular incident inclined me to the church. I was um, a judge and then there was a problem in the church at the time, cathedral. They brought the case to my court and I went to court without looking at anybody's face, gave a stand judgment and warning and left to do other things. Unknown to me, I was a, the, the then bishop was greatly impressed by my performance. I was fair to all and I gave a stand judgment and left my way. So immediately, the chancellor before me retired, he just called me from Enugu to come and be the chancellor, chancellor for Nigeria. And of course, in the service of the church, I accepted, I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed the relationship I had with the later uh, bishop. Yes, well, what, those who follow things like that uh, in the media will see you, your picture from time to time uh, with Her Excellency uh, or your spouse at various church events you know, uh, d down the years. And one would wonder with how we see things going on. You then made yet another switch now to the world of diplomacy. Yes. You, uh, you became uh, Nigeria's High Commissioner to the United Kingdom. Is it really different from being a judge? Oh, certainly different. How so? Much different. Firstly, your way of life is altered. You will have to be careful how you handle uh, secrets. You'll have to remember that from time to time you are meeting foreigners within your area of uh, authority. So all these things will condition your approach in life to see that you do not do anything that will cast uh, anything uh, uh, like an expansion on your country. So gradually you are remodified in the nature of the work you are doing. 
What has been your experience? You've been here now as uh, um, uh, High Commissioner. It's going to three years. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's almost three years. What has been your experience like? Especially given the background you've given us that you were here as a student. Uh, in the beginning, I was angry with the system here. But after a year or so, I sat up and uh, took the same ranks as uh, others. That arose from the fact that um, there was always some dispute, one or the other, within uh, subordinates. And when you, when you made the orders to see that you wanted the things done a certain way, they turned uh, unwilling to bend. So that uh, forces your hands regularly. I had that. And then uh, also, we had uh, difficulties um, getting remittance from uh, our home base. Okay. It's not that you don't get money, but it comes late. So such things constitute uh, problems for you. But at the end of the day, you did your work and uh, it went very well. What has been your relationship like with uh, Nigerians here in the UK? Well, you had uh, difficult times with them. That is to say they wanted things their own way and we also insist on doing that way that complies with, with those set down for us as standards. But now there has been like an accord because you've met them some way, they've met you some way. Very, very true. Because I, I, I've spoken to some of uh, the Nigerians here and they talk about improvements in consular services, improvements in response time to queries about passports issuance and numbers and things like that. How did you do that? No, that had nothing to do with me because we never faulted in any area with the supply of uh, passports. All that happened was uh, this uh, young man walking in the in the uh, chancery sometimes misbehave. They requested things that they, they shouldn't uh, record. I took a farm stance and that can cause a problem. Now, uh, today, generally speaking, um, when people travel, it seems as if it's not the habit of Nigerians, unlike some other countries, that one of their first ports of call when you go to a foreign country should be your home country's embassy. To yes. say, oh, I'm here, register yourselves in some way and say, I'm here on this thing, I'm here to do this and so on. I'm hoping to be around for this length of time. Most people, as the reports say, most people end up talking about the Nigerian embassy only when they get into trouble. Yes. How are you tackling that? Because when they then get into trouble, you don't even know how to reach them. Because they didn't tell you they were around, they, didn't, they have not come to report themselves, you don't have any information about them. That is the question of rascalities, even in old age. When they do such things, those who can uh, remedy for them, you do those who cannot, you let go. The proper thing is that you must comply with the law that directs you as a commission. Now, uh, the Nigerian High Commission in Britain is one of the most prominent in the world. It is. It's also one of the biggest uh, around the world because of Nigeria's traditional relationship with Britain. How have you found working with your uh, opposite numbers in the uh, British uh, uh, side of the establishment? I was oh, looking at a picture of you. Well, from time to time, we meet at meetings, conferences, regularly. And they're always inviting us to one thing or the other so that uh, our mind school meet over certain matters. So it's quite a good uh, relationship. You've hosted the president severally uh, in the period that you've been here. Yes. And for, for many uh, high commissioners, that's about the height of their stay in any country when the president of the home comes. How, how was that experience? Well, it's a very good um, 
experience, the president is able to deal with me with love and uh, nicely. And I say, I always say, don't they say, pay due respect to him and give him adequate respect, commensurate with his uh, position. So, Your Excellency, I said, I wanted you to enlighten us a little about some of the key lessons you, you've taken away from 80 years as you celebrate, as you mark these 80 years. What are some of those key lessons that when you sit back, you point at and you say one, two, three are critical things that I've picked up in the last 80 years? In the last 80 years? Well, in the beginning, that's uh, my education in uh, London. I was uh, a young man that uh, enjoyed life. In my student days, we were playing rough and things like that, uh, bulky and things. Uh, but at the end of the day, God intervened in my life such that with, uh, with those experiences, I was able to do my degree with honors. For a rascal, always at the bookshop and things, and I just wonder how I could uh, have been able to do that. More than that, I made good uh, friends here as uh, students, although many of them uh, have passed on. And when you remember, you have memories of them. You wish they were alive because they were really their friends. And going back home from here coincided with uh, the same going back home for other lawyers, other students with me. So even from here, we formed the friendships of all the types. I didn't want to be a judge. I wanted to make money at the bar. But because of the pressure that the people of Equal brought on me that to say that uh, we have a son, he must represent us, they like to boast with you. That uh, encouraged me to take to the bar, to the bench. And uh, I've enjoyed it. I've uh, enjoyed my time in it. I've learned a lot. I've learned uh, hard things. And I've learned to know how to avoid problems and things like that. And that, when you've mastered it, will endear you till you, you die because you become more wise in many things. Things you should, where you should keep quiet, you keep quiet. Where you should say much, you say much. So it will have altered your life in various ways. Have uh, had that uh, experience. Here I'm an ambassador. The president of the country wished it and also willing to participate and see what it's like. And it's been quite uh, good and uh, enduring. I enjoyed it. If you, if you were to describe, many people talk about legacy. What do you think or what would you like your legacy to be? What would you want people to remember you for? I will give it in the church uh, terms. The, the God made his use of me. Um, everything, anything I did, I was uh, with the inspiration of God. Sometimes I add, God forgive that. Those ideas that God has, uh, I believe, sanctioned my deeds. And looking ahead, are you going to write a book, for example? Many people who are lucky enough to reach 80. Well, I will uh, try, if I could. You know, when you reach 80, the brain is not uh, working as uh, sharp as uh, it is before. But I'll uh, muster some uh, energy and make an attempt. The ambience that you have, given the situation today, that straddles these three areas we've talked about during the course of this interview, your career as a jurist, your career in the church, and now your career as a diplomat. For treachers as it does appear to be, did you see the common thread in it? Did you see a common thread in it? Are they joined in your mind? That's a, a religious question. Yes, <laughs> it is. Well, I started life, like I said to you, with my uncle, 
who was a teacher, a strict teacher. In that uh, course, he imposed strict discipline on me and I bowed substantially to the teaching of a teacher and I believe that that will have uh, uh, stuck up with me for years. Then, uh, in the bar, I saw the strengths and weaknesses of the bar. Some lawyers sometimes annoyed me. Some I could forgive, some I couldn't forgive. Well, may God decide who is right now. And um, going to towards the end of um, judiciary, I, will, I could look back and recall that uh, I enjoyed my time on the bench. I served virtually every part of the country, everywhere you can think of, Lagos, Ibadan, Jos, uh, Enugu, virtually everywhere in the country. So I can boast and say that oh, I know my country very well. And that knowledge, what does it tell you about us as a people, our country? Well, we are Christians. It uh, encourages us to judge every step we take and to be careful the next step. You, you must learn day after day in your life. You cannot get it right all, all the time, but you must learn from age to age. And what would be your advice for Nigerians watching this as we continue to try to follow in the footsteps of development of our country? What, what, what would you ask your fellow citizens, both at home and abroad, to be well, mindful of? Well, in a broad of? sense, you could say that you pray for Nigeria. But more directly, I would say that uh, I pray that my children, my relations, follow the right path of life. It's that that will give a learning, that will give encouragement, that will steer them away from parts of uh, shame. Because but, they are coming in Nigeria. And um, unity. What's unity in the Brussels? Yes, unity in our country. Because a lot of people wonder about that. And they look up to people like you to say, do you think we will continue to be? You who has been everywhere, you've seen people from different parts of the country, you've seen the problems that are there, you've seen the challenges, but you've also seen some of the successes mm -hmm. in those places. What would be your thoughts or what would be your own comment about our unity going forward? What should we be doing to enhance that? Well, the best way to make a judgment is to look at your immediate environment and from there to learn how you relate in other areas. I think that uh, there has been some uh, weakness where we don't want in Nigeria. And in another way, I know that there are goodness, progress, and things like that, even in today's Nigeria. It's not a total condemnation. We've learned a lot from it. And then going forward? Going forward, we keep praying to God to keep us in the part of where we have properly worked on and to steer us back in the areas where we have deliberately gone wrong. You were one of those who encouraged interfaith dialogue, religious tolerance, and so on uh, during your time in offices of the church. And um, there were those who, during the time when you were, were saying that enough of that is not being done, that, and a lot of some of the misconceptions and misunderstanding comes from a lack of knowledge. Today, when you look back at that episode, at that period, and all the efforts you made in that regard, do you still hold on to your belief that that interfaith dialogue and tolerance initiative is... Well, the, the way it works is this. In some areas, you never get to know enough to, to be able to judge yourself. On the other hand, there are areas which uh, patently point to you that you have had there, you could have done this, you could have done here. Those who 
put together and rectify those who can. Those who cannot, you leave it to God. Forgive me. That's the way. Judge yourself. Determine whether you've done the right thing and pray to God to forgive you if you have sinned. What would be your final words to Nigerians? Well, I know that uh, Nigeria is in various uh, difficulties. I can see that the Nigerians at various levels are trying to amend, to enable us to do better. But I'll be happier if we do more. In what specific areas? Broad areas across the country. Nigerians don't uh, take time to reflect and see that they do things only after the matters involved have been well thought out. We tend to do things wrongly and start to correct later. We should straighten the country. The president I serve is, a, in my judgment, excellent because those who think otherwise don't know him. But I know him. I know he's a, an excellent man, straightforward, and a true president for Nigeria. If I had a way to elongate his uh, tenure, I would put uh, a voice. People don't know, but we know that uh, he's serving the country. Humble, modest, and a leader for a country. I hope it will endure. Justice Okutadi, it's been our pleasure. Thank you very much for speaking with us. God bless you. Thank you very God much. You. Yes. Thank you, Thank very, you very much. much. Thank you. That's News Night today. Thanks for watching. Let's hear from you about this and other conversations we have had. The handles are right there on your screen. I am Ladi Akiri Dolwale. Goodbye.